Snastrunk. You can't blame kids for souring so quickly on edutainment games. Anytime a game actually tried to teach you something, it was usually done in a way that didn't make for a game that was actually good. Stuff like Mario is Missing or Captain Novelin were nice enough ideas for games with good intentions, but they just sucked to play. So when I saw games like Liberty or Death available for rent or purchase, I stayed far away. All it took was seeing George Washington's gloomy, tired expression, and it's like, yeah, I don't need any more of that in my life right now unless it's on a dollar bill. I already spend five days a week at school. I don't need more school at home, thanks. The thing is, though, titles like Liberty or Death in particular aren't always made with kids in mind. They're also made to appeal to tech-affluent adults like my dad, for example. And like many dads, he loves anything to do with history, especially if there's war involved. And while I couldn't imagine him ever picking up a Super Nintendo controller, if he ever did get into a game, it would probably be something like Liberty or Death. So who knows, maybe there's a lot of dads out there that liked this game at the time. Liberty or Death is a turn-based strategy game that's set during the American Revolutionary War back in the 18th century, and this one was originally made for DOS and PC-9801 back in 1993, before getting ports to the SNES and Sega Genesis the next year. So yeah, this is a PC port, and when it comes to home console PC ports, your mileage is always going to vary, usually from pretty good to really bad. I do have good news though, the game and the port were both made by Koei as part of their historical simulation series along with stuff like Genghis Khan, Nobunaga's Ambition, and Romance of the Three Kingdoms. And while they didn't always make for the most intuitive games, Koei were as capable as anyone to handle a task like streamlining a menu-heavy and text-heavy PC game into a home console port. The manual they provided for the Super Nintendo version is 70 pages long, and it details all the events and prominent characters of the Revolutionary War, and there's some good stuff on Game Facts as well, so if you really want to dive into a 30-year-old game about a war that happened nearly 300 years ago, well then, here you go. You start out being asked to pick between George Washington or Thomas Gage, and this game is two-player, with the British attacking and Americans defending. And I'm gonna pick old George because he's six foot eight and weighs a freaking ton. Opponents beware. Anyway, you start the game meeting with Congress to sort out the budget, hanging out with John Hancock and John Adams and other dudes named John. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I could be destroying killer robots and Contra, but nah, let's facilitate connectivity with our founding fathers. These Congress sessions pop up every three months in game time, asking you to make decisions like asking where you'd like to place additional troops and how much money they make. If you offer less than the initial amount that first pops up, then their loyalty and happiness will go down. So yeah, to start out, you'll want to give them what they want and give the rest to fleet support and regiments. After that's sorted, you end up at this map with 53 different regions. Yup, this is a Koei strategy game, alright. You select a region and it brings up a menu with that region's commanding officer. Domestic is all the stuff you can do to drum up local support for the war, like throwing parades and publishing propaganda. Materials consist of food, gunpowder, weapons, artillery, and transportation you can buy or build for that commander in that region. Personnel is how you recruit and manage troops, and to give a quick example, the green regions you see on a map here are local militias. So if your reputation is good enough, you can go recruit those guys to fight for you. You can also bribe British officers, as well as furlough your own officers, which refreshes them and increases their loyalty to you. There's lots of other stuff too, like holding a draft amongst the local population, repairing and reforming battered units, increasing training, and so on and so forth. Did you get all that? Well, hold on, because there's more. What's with all the numbers underneath each officer? The 730 isn't how many couches Ethan Allen owns, but how many troops he has. The 2 out of 2 means there's two officers, the thumbs up means you have good local support, and the right column is money, gunpowder, artillery, and food. It's a lot of stuff to manage and to think about, but thankfully the personnel menu option at least has an option at the bottom labeled authorize, which means you can skip all this stuff and let the computer handle it, so you can just focus on the battles. But unfortunately, when it comes to the battles, they really aren't all that interesting. Each takes place on a grid-based map, with each tile having its own terrain. You're moving around icons one space at a time, and it's the usual turn-based stuff where the terrain affects certain kinds of units, and ultimately you want to move your guys around until your little guy has a higher number than their little guy. If your commander-in-chief is captured, it's game over. If you capture theirs, you win the battle and the territory, and the war rages onward. There's a ton of stuff I haven't even touched yet, like the fact that there's other countries watching what you're doing, the French, Spanish, and Dutch are all making their own demands and taking sides, and that spices things up a bit. 
One funny trick I learned in this game is the spy function listed in the info menu. It's kind of luck based, but if you assign a spy with a high tactical rating, they'll usually come back with information on enemy officers. What you can do is pick out someone with a low loyalty rating, then send one of your officers with a high reputation rating and bribe them. It doesn't work immediately, but if you keep bothering someone with bribes, even if it's just 10 bucks, their loyalty rating will continue to plummet and you'll eventually win over their entire battalion. That's actually a really cool touch and it goes to show the sheer amount of stuff in this game. So yeah, is Liberty or Death a well-made game on Super Nintendo? Surprisingly, yes it is, but does that make it worth playing today? Eh, probably not, considering you can get a modern PC game with modern graphics, fewer confusing menus, and way more interesting battles, like Ultimate General. I will say, Koei did a really nice job with this game, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm actually somewhat excited to dive into some of their other strategy games. I really appreciate being able to see the perspective from both the American and British sides, with the Americans dealing with such limited resources while the British had their huge army and massive economy. Even then, if you hate play through this game as the British just to stick it to America, that brings about its own set of challenges since their officers aren't as loyal, reputable, or tactically sound. Now, would I care about any of that as a 12-year-old? Absolutely not, but as a withering, dithering 42-year-old 30 years later, I can appreciate Liberty or Death for what it is. Alright, that's all for now and I want to thank you for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day.